This is Bumper to Bumper, the car show. Drive in anxious and cruise out confident. With the best automotive information for your vehicle. And now your hosts, Matt Allen and Dave Riccio. Well, good morning and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen along here with Dave Riccio. Riccio, I'm sorry Dave, Riccio. Easy. Ooh, I'm out of breath. I had to run over here to this microphone. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sad. I, I'm falling asleep at the switch here. But anyway, Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are here every Saturday morning at 11 to help you, the motoring public, with your car. Have an over, overall better experience. It doesn't matter if you've got car questions, car problems, you're selling the car, buying the car, you got a list of repairs. If you've got questions, we've got answers. So all you have to do is give us a call at 602 602- Two seven seven five eight two seven six zero two two seven seven K T A R and if you like to text you can do that at four one one nine two three. And today on the roadmap, what's the technology in the presidential limo? You know, I, was, I think they're upgrading it lately. <laughs> they're upgrading. I was I was watching some of that stuff yesterday. I was really taking cue on some of the limo stuff. Of course, open phones and text. And are you playing the gas gauge? Limbo, you know, how low can you go on that gauge before you run out of gas? Kind Looks of like we're going to need some gas. Where is it now? There's still some overlap between the needle and the slash below the E. How low are you going to go? Well, I've been in the slash many times. And this is nothing. You'll get used to it. Just put it out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all, I mean, that's a, if you didn't hear that real well or don't know, that's a episode from Seinfeld where Kramer's out in the car and, I mean, they're they're pushing the pushing the limit. I think there was another one of those where they were had the new car dealer and they were they were pushing the you know you want to see how far you can go. <laughs> and we used to have the the you know used to just have the gauge and man what <laughs> when is empty really empty right? But now there's the light. What's the light mean? Oh, you know, and I <laughs> this hits home because I ran out of gas driving to San Diego <laughs> this last year. Brand new car. I'm driving along. I got a quarter tank of gas and I go through El Centro, and I'm like 20 miles past it, and all of a sudden the car just dies. And I'm like, whoa. You know, so I call the little OnStar deal, and they're on the phone, and they're like, are you out of gas? And I'm like, no, it's got a quarter tank, you know, and I'm mad at the lady for asking me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, how far can you push it? And I always push it. I mean, that's it's really not the way to go because it's bad for your, for your fuel pump to be... <laughs> You know, a little yeah. suction noise, or like when you were a kid, you would sit there and slurp your straw when your soda was empty at the restaurant, and your dad hit you behind the head. A little annoying. <laughs> at least mine you did. Know, I, I, I do it in my truck all the time. I'm just going. I don't pay attention to that. And then next thing you know, oh, man, out of the fuel, the light comes on. Oh, and then I forget. I swear, I've had mine. I probably got some pictures on my Facebook. Zero miles still empty. Man, you want to talk about pucker factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I literally needed – my gas light came on on Thursday. And so I'm like, okay, I could just get to work. And then Friday I rode my, my, my bike to work, and my wife came pick me up in tr- my truck, and she's like, you know, you're out of gas. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're still, we're still good. <laughs> <laughs> but I reset the trip meter every time I get gas and every time I push it a little further. Like when I first got that truck, I knew I could go 312 miles. Then it was 330, 340, 350. And so I know, like, 350, I'm living on borrowed time because I've really run that that light out for a couple of days, and it's time to get in. And even today, I mean, I was driving. I had to stop and get gas when I called you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and we found this the chart online, an article about uh, about this same thing. And what somebody has done, they've gone in and done a little research. And, you know, usually your owner's manual will tell you how many miles or how many gallons – of fuel are in the tank when that light comes on. I guess we have to assume that they're pretty well calibrated. I mean, they mm-hmm. can't all be exact. And then based off of if you have the little chip computer, you're getting 14.2 miles of the gallon or whatever it is. There's some algorithm, some mathematics, and they're they're going to calculate the the uh, what you've got left before you're walking. But apparently it's not so accurate because they did some tests and and then and then uh, compared them to to. Uh, you know, if the thing says you got three gallons of, like for example, there's a Dodge Ram says you got three gallons of fuel, well, that Dodge Ram probably gets 20, you know, 18 miles of the gallon maybe. So what's that? 60, 54 gallons. Well, or 54 miles. So this says it goes 63 to 87. Well, that's pretty close. But if it's using your average, I mean, if you're lead foot for the first half of the tank, 
Well, second half, if you're really lighter when that fuel light comes on, I, I guess you probably could stretch it. That's maybe why we see these numbers. And you can find all this information if you go to bumper to bumper radiocom go to our Facebook link, you find it. I put that up there this morning. But I'm looking at some of these. Most of them, it seems like the smaller the car, the less the capacity once the light turns on. So a Civic is going to come on with 1.9 gallons in the tank. Civic probably gets a little better gas mileage than the CRV. The CRV, the gas light comes on with 2.3 gallons in the tank. And it almost looks like, on average, I would say 50 miles once the light comes on is probably a safe bet. And they also tend to top out at 80 miles. But there's a couple that have, you know, they go another 100 miles. Now, this one from Volkswagen, I just don't believe it. I don't know why, but I feel like their numbers are pumped. <laughs> yeah. Hey, not only was it fuel mile, well, I guess, is this a TDI in here, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't say what kind of Jetta it is, but it says the Jetta will go 57 to 85 miles once that fuel light turns on. But some of them have the miles to empty thing, and that's just a kind of a calibration. Well, that's the math I was just talking about. Depending on your driving habits. So if you drive... You know, if your foot is always in the gas, so my car, my wife's car is supposed to get 20 miles to the gallon, but when I drive it, it literally gets 12. <laughs> That's all I do is, is... So she could stretch the light longer than you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So... You ever have a customer bring a car in? <laughs> funny ever story. I got a funny you, story. Ever since you worked on my car, my mileage has gone bad. Well, you know, we might have to get in the car and accelerate hard or do something we're blowing it out so oh, to yeah. speak well what we've done is reduce the average and, and they think it's reflective of actual miles to gallon so you really kind of off topic but if you're looking to get your true miles per gallon the computer on the car is probably a good it's barometer a, yeah. to maybe change just to feel how it averages but if you want to know you've got to do some math well, and you, we've all got that friend, and I've done it before. He wants to see how much he can get that number to, so he's working every hill, and he's like, I can coast up to the hill. And and basically, when you come to the stoplight, you don't go as fast as you can and then slam on the brakes right before the stoplight. Oh, really? Oh, I do. <laughs> but you, you annoy some other people in traffic. You just you slow down way earlier, just back off way early, hoping to get that light green by the time you get there. Using the momentum of the car. So I literally had a customer come to my shop. And uh, her car got towed in, and she came in, and she read me the riot act. Man, you guys, three thousand dollars on my car, and it's on the his her car's on the back of a tow truck. It's a Ford Explorer, and uh, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, we're we'll gonna see what's going on, and and uh, anyway, it's pulled around back, and my technician comes and grabs me, and he goes, I said, what's wrong with her car? He goes, it's out of gas, <laughs> and she's reading you the riot act. Reading me the riot act. So go easy on your technician until you know it's his fault. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's funny. You start looking at the uh, some of these mileage. You mentioned Volkswagen, Dave. You know, they got the uh, $4 billion fine. Mm. And uh, I guess there's some people that could be, I think one of those executives could be looking at life in prison for Ouch. violating that. So, man, not. I mean, it's funny in our end, but, man, there's some people there that are wishing they made did some things different. And I'm hearing some rumors that may even have bled out into Ford, Chrysler, well, Fiat. I mean, I... I'm not not Ford Chrysler, uh, Fiat Group Chrysler Jeep. You can go every year. You can go back in time. It's like Hyundai got in trouble for Hyundai Kia back in the day for this wasn't too long ago for kind of you know fluffing their numbers a little bit. Remember, glitter's not gold. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> right? Glitter's not gold. But you know, back in the day, I was always told, hey, don't let your fuel tank ever get below a quarter tank. And the reason for that is your fuel pump is now in the fuel tank. Okay. And the fuel is surrounding that pump, and when you run it below a quarter tank, that pump is starting to be in atmosphere, so it's not cooled by the fuel. So technically, your fuel pump will last longer in your tank if you don't run it down and get that suction noise out of it. Yeah, right, sucking air. Hey, you know, one of the things we mentioned coming into the start of the show was the presidential limousine. And, and I certain things that I notice, I'm looking at these cars, watching some of this inauguration stuff, Trump, like him or not, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about the, talking about the cars. You know, I'm looking at this limo yesterday and it's not the new one. I did, you know, checked out this morning. There's a new one coming for 2017, but you know, God, just look at the size of the tires on this thing. This is a cushy Cadillac, right? But the things, you know, you look underneath it and, and uh, see how the thing's built. They say it's basically built on a tank frame. So, you know, probably a heavy-duty truck frame, diesel engine, uh, pretty uh, 
Oh, yeah. Heavy it's duty stuff on that car. It's sealed. And they're only like $1.2 million, which is not bad. I mean, considering <laughs> yeah. they got 10 or 12 of them, that's yeah. not too bad. Yeah, I think they said they have a fleet of 12 of them. And it, and it talked about why they don't have, you know, they, some, someone mentioned, well, why don't they have printing capabilities in office and command center? And really, those limos, there's, like I said, there's about 12 of them. And they're only in them for a few minutes. You know, they come to Arizona. The president's only in that limousine, maybe with the governor or somebody else. They're having some small chit-chat. They're not doing work in there. So that's why they're not set up like an office. But, you know, some of those things that it has, like uh, tear gas cannons. You know, oh, yeah, it's handy. Kinda, I want one of those in my rig. It was kind of neat. And then uh, Kevlar reinforced run-flat tires, which are probably one off. For, I, I, I bet they're not making them for anything else. Yeah, no, I mean that's a that's a presidential special, I'm sure. Uh, what else do they have? They're sealed with their own air system, so they can uh, sur- uh, sustain the chemical or biological attack. Uh, what else? Dave? I'm not that? sure, but if I had to bet, I bet you that that presidential limo's got an interstate battery in it. <laughs> I was gonna go there. I, you know that that that's that's true. They they probably should. You know. Because it, if it's got an interstate battery, they're not going to be stuck. That sucker's not going to pull up to the you know, Air Force One. <laughs> it doesn't start. Yeah, that's that, embarrassing. That, that that's would embarrassing. probably be embarrassing. So I, I bet the Secret Service maybe does have a deal with interstate batteries, huh? <laughs> and they probably got a backup to the backup to the backup interstate battery. But I'm sure they're all interstate batteries. they got to be, especially if they came to uh, any of the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio that carry <laughs> interstate batteries. So anyhow, when we come back, we're taking your phone calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Any questions in regard to your car, maybe got a weird noise, and if you got a noise, we're going to make you make it over the air, that's for sure. Maybe got a weird vibration, maybe got some sort of strange intermittent problem. Maybe you just want to talk about a car you're thinking about buying or a car you're thinking about selling. We can help you with all that, 602-277-5827. You're listening to Matt and Dave, your KTR Car Guys on Bumper to Bumper Radio. The Waste Management Phoenix Open, presented by the Akchen Indian Community, is a golf tournament like no other. Huge crowds, enthusiastic fans, exciting golf. It's truly the People's Open. Please enjoy the tournament and have fun. Remember, be safe, act responsibly, and behave with class. Let's show the world that we have the greatest fans in golf. Respect the fans, respect the players, respect the game at the 2017 Waste Management Phoenix Open, January 30th through February 5th at TPC Scottsdale. Trust. It's hard to earn and sometimes even harder to find. If you live or work in downtown Phoenix, Matt Allen's Virginia Auto Service is celebrating over 20 years of award-winning service at the corner of 7th Street and Virginia. Recognized as one of the best service shops in the country, their customers have come to trust Virginia Auto Service for its A-plus rating by the BBB, two-year, 24,000-mile warranties, and free transportation to and from your home or office. 20-plus years of earning your trust. Virginia Auto Service. They're serious about service. Few cities are as car-centric as Phoenix, and this is the show that'll help you to better understand that machine you depend on to get around the valley. It's Bumper to Bumper Radio. KTAR News on 92.3 FM and the KTAR app for Android and iPhone. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and together we are KTAR Car Guys, heard every Saturday at 11 o'clock. To get a hold of the show, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Don't be shy. If you've got a question on your car, we can certainly give you a hand with that. Presidential limos, how much fuel you need. When you run on, you know, yellow, when that yellow light comes on, I, I used to think it meant hurry. You better hurry to get to the gas. <laughs> Step on the gas. Step on the gas. Light, right? You want to milk it, turn the AC off, and, and don't hit the brakes so hard. No, Dave, I, I learned the yellow light in high school driver's ed. It means proceed with caution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true of uh, warning lights on your dashboard. Yellow is not, not a super, super emergency, but it should not be ignored. And then red on your dashboard means pull over if you can. If you're in a safe place, pull over. Stop. What does blue mean? Uh, blue, I don't know what it means. Is that a, is there a blue light on the dash? High beams. No, it means there's a special going on. <laughs> blue light special. <laughs> woo, woo. Well, they do have the blue light. You have the one for the high beam. Oh, high beams, but, right. But, you know, the other blue light that you might see this time of year, you know, and I didn't ever see this light till I got my Scion. Ice light? Well, well, that too, but there's a blue light on the dash. When the car's not up to operating temperature, 
it's blue Ooh. and then it goes off. So, you know, we get some check engine lights this time of year. You might notice your check engine light coming on, especially if it's colder today. Mm-hmm. If you look down, notice your heat's not working too. You know, if the car is not up to operating temperature, it's not going to run well. It's not going to have the good emissions output that the manufacturers want. So we see thermostats fail. And, and one of those common problems is people are like, yeah. I don't have any heat either. Oh, oh man, my thermostat in my know. truck is out, and it takes like 15 minutes for the heater to work. So I just wear a big old jacket because, <laughs> you know, it's like a cobbler's kid goes without shoes. You know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyhow, let's go with Mike in Glendale. He's got a 2009 Volkswagen Rutan. How can we help you, Mike? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. What I have is um, I had brakes done about a year ago, you know, front and rear and with uh, even they removed the the fluid, put new fluid in, and what's happened? Like six months later, you know the uh, brake light, ABS, and ESP comes on, and it, it did that for a few days. You know, stayed on, and then it went away, and it's been away. Now it's come back again, and it seems to be staying. It's been almost like four or five days, and uh, it comes on after you know you, once the car started, and you move about a block. It just comes on. I did have the codes checked in you know, our local parts place. I don't have any codes that uh, tell me anything is wrong. I do have good brakes. You know, nothing has changed. It's just a like a sensor problem that's just intermittent coming on. Uh, sure. I remember the old vehicles, they had like a little bit of a air bubble in the fluid lines. You would get your brake light to come on. And yeah. They had to bleed them real well. I don't know. Mike, now it's different. It's a newer deal now. Yeah, Mike, what happens here, you can have the brake light come on for a couple different reasons on, on your car and most car or a lot of cars. A lot of cars, especially European cars, have brake pad sensors that when the brakes wear down, they will come in contact with the brake rotor that completes the circuit or in some cases it opens a circuit and it will cause the brake warning light to come on. That's not what you have. That's probably what you had when you had your brakes done a year ago. And that was a symbol to, to let you know the brake pads were worn out. But when you've got a brake light accompanied by an ABS light, which is anti-lock brakes and the EPS or e- ESP or whichever acronym. Extra Volkswagen, special powers. Extra special powers, yeah. That has to do with the stability control. So you have a failure in any one of those systems, it will turn on all three of those lights typically. Now, so we, what we need to do is go find out why is that light coming on. There's a f- component failure, probably a speed sensor. Again, you start rolling, the, the computer needs to know how fast is the car going to control the analog brakes and any of the uh, stability control functions. So we need to get the code out. But what you said is common. People go to the auto parts store and they get the codes read. And, Dave, I know you see this with transmissions all the time at Tri-City Transmission. Their equipment is not sophisticated enough. It's only giving you a little glimpse you know, through the little peephole. It's not the front door open. You get to see everything. So their equipment can't read the ABS codes, can't read the transmission. It can only read the basic stuff that they can get codes for, basically. So you need to find a good shop. You're in... You're in Glendale, Dave's Car Care, 51st Avenue, uh, uh, in Peoria over there. They can take care of you or anybody on the bumper to bumper radiocom list of shops. For sure. Well, thanks for the call, Mike. 602-277-5827. We've got Stephen, Vicky, and Juan, but we're going to go with Will in Peoria. He's got a 2001 Dodge Ram. How can we help you, Will? You're on bumper to bumper radio. Hey, guys. Um I got a problem when I put the, the heater on. I smell antifreeze, but I'm not losing any antifreeze, and it's not wet on the inside where the heater core is. I can't figure it out because it doesn't it doesn't blow as hot as it should either. Do you get any uh, when you turn on the defroster? You get any uh, steam feels like comes out of there on the window? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid what's going on is that you're starting to get a leak in that heater core. I mean, that's the only way you get that, you know, that smell of coolant inside the cab is that thing starting to leak. Well, it may not be leaking enough where you're, uh, you have a puddle on the ground or you're getting low on coolant, but it may leak enough where you're smelling it. So, that's a fun job, the old heater core job. I mean, the only way to get to most of them. Some of them are easy to get to, and then some of them. I don't remember on a Dodge how easy or not easy it is, but generally the behind the glove box. Uh, and it's like well, a little behind the glove box. Is stating it pretty easy. <laughs> that's like saying the engine's under the hood. I right, mean, that's it, true. It's there somewhere, <laughs> but uh... but typically it's that direction of the car, and it's just like a little mini radiator that's inside your dashboard, and that's where the smell's coming I from. I mean, it could you could take literally a couple ounces in that in that uh, coolant's kind of oily, and it will just kind of linger and have a film on there, and you get that odor. 
But one thing you can do after you drive the car today and it's hot, make sure this – well, before you do anything, make sure it's full and you've got a good rate – well – Good, good, good radiator cap. Now we're just building more pressure. We're gonna, right. we're gonna create the leak. But what I'm getting at is, by driving the car normally, you can create pressure in this system, and that's like us doing a cooling system pressure test. You could then maybe go on the passenger side floorboard area underneath the car and look up in the drain. And after that thing has had some time to sit with pressure for a while, you might be able to confirm it by verifying some liquid. But chances are, you've got a bad heater. Yeah, we know that we. We know that smell, and that's one of the things that never gets repaired in this town because it's always expensive to pull a dashboard out of the car, you know. And, uh, and you know, you can live without a heater in Phoenix. You can't live without a heater in Flagstaff if you live in Flagstaff. Well, and there's certain times a year, I mean, in August, you come in with a broken heater core, we're not fixing it. My yeah. technicians don't want to be. I mean, you got to see the way these guys are contorted underneath the dash. And <clears throat> I mean, I've had guys, you know, with the driver's seat reclined and laying on their back and just their heads up underneath the. Yeah, some of the best the technicians are really flexible. <laughs> Yes. They get upside down underneath the dashboard. We need to start uh, recruiting from the gymnastics. <laughs> or, or, you know, Ringling uh, Brothers Circus is gone now. We need some of those guys that can contort and get un underneath these cars and you know, and fix them. Maybe. You know, you notice, Matt, we see cars come in our shop, and you notice when they're kind of fairly new, everything gets taken care of. But as they get a little further along in their life cycle, maybe second owner, third owner, you start to see things not get fixed. And the heater core is one of them. I'm trying to think of some of the other stuff that doesn't get fixed. There's a lot of people running around with uh, one hubcap on a car. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, power yeah. windows or door handles. You know, there's some people that got to roll the, the windows, windows down switches. every time to yeah. open the door. I'm the, like, how long can you live like that? I, I hate to admit, I went to a drive through the other day, and it wasn't at Starbucks. <laughs> and the person in front of me pulls up. I'm like, where are they pulling up so far, so far for? Oh, they had to get out of the car because their window doesn't work, you know? <laughs> um yeah, you know, window regulators, and I did one for my friend uh, Ron uh, yesterday. He said, well, what's the deal with the window regulators? I said, you own, ever own one of those inkjet printers, you know? <laughs> I said, you got to buy ink all the time. Well, window regulators, there was a section of time where those things, they went out like popcorn, pop, pop, pop. They were going out all the time. Well, it's funny, certain models, too. There was some Jeeps. Oh, yeah, years Liberties. Ago, Woo! Constantly, and they were like five, $600. And I mean, gosh, these are expensive. Man, it's amazing how the how when those are failing under warranty, how quickly the manufacturer drops that price. That that part went to like seventy two dollars or something crazy <laughs> like that. Well, yeah. it was raining yesterday. My friend pulls up and he's got a plastic bag over the window with that blue painter's tape holding the <laughs> bag on there. And I said, "Hey, Ron, which window is it again that's bad?" He's like, uh, "The one with the plastic bag and the blue tape." Yeah. He's driving down the freeway, things flapping in his ear. Anyhow, when we come back, we're taking your phone calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. We've got Ron, we've got Juan, we've got Vicky, and we got Steven, and probably time for a couple more calls. You can also text us at 411-923. Listen to Matt and Dave on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, I'm Roger Bland with the Automatic Transmission Rebuilders Association, ATRA. As a transmission industry advocate, I travel throughout North America, studying transmission shops, looking for the best of the best that our industry has to offer. Professionally, ethically run shops that are proud to display the ATRA logo. I was recently in Arizona because I had heard from more than one source that I had to check out Tri-City Transmission right here in Tempe. Folks, I've been in the transmission industry for over 25 years, and I'm here to tell you that Tri-City is the type of transmission shop we're proud to call an ATRA member. Not only does Tri-City Transmission meet the stringent code of ethics set forth for every member of the association, they also have an extraordinary approach to solving their customers' problems. You see, they don't just focus on what it is they produce, transmissions. Their true concern is about fixing your problem, and take it from me. That's a big difference. To learn more about Tri-City Transmission, find them at TriCityTransmission.com. That's TriCityTransmission.com. Quiet, please. The Waste Management Phoenix Open is back, and you can go as a VIP this year, courtesy of our friends at Visit Central Oregon. Go to BunkerGolf.com and click on the VIP Experience banner and enter to win. Winner receives tickets, members club passes for four, and reserve parking at the Greenish Show on Grass. Stop by the Visit Central Oregon booth in the Expo Tent for another chance to win a golf vacation to Bend Sun River, Oregon, with over 30 courses including three in Golf Digest Top 100. Central Oregon. Adventure Calls. 
There's nothing more important than family. Hi, Kurt Rock for Kurt's Auto Repair. Family owned and operated and bumper to bumper radio preferred. We've been taking care of Valley families and their auto care needs with a perfect better business record for over 27 years. Come experience the difference our ASE Master Techs can make for you and your family at Kurt's Auto Repair. Just east of I-17 at 22nd Avenue and Bell Road or online at mycarhurts.com. Gas or diesel, foreign or domestic. If your car hurts, take it to Kurt. KTAR FM, Glendale, Phoenix. KTAR News on 92.3 FM. Arizona's news station. News station. KTAR on air. 92.3 FM. Online at KTAR.com and streaming live on the KTAR News app. Your breaking news and traffic now. It's 1130. I'm Allie Vetner. Here's our top story. At least four people are dead after a tornado ripped through southern Mississippi early this morning. Coming into town of Hadesburg, Forest County Coroner Butch Benedict says an entire trailer park was destroyed and two people there died in their beds. Mississippi Emergency Management says 16,000 people are still without power in the area and they're deploying tents and emergency food services to help those displaced with other with another storm brewing tonight. You could hear the sirens going off. Our phones were, you know, we had the alerts on our phones. They were going all just happened so quick. The Women's March on Washington is underway and people are pouring into the area surrounding the Washington Mall. ABC's Brad Milkey is traveling to it along with thousands of participants. I'm at the Federal Center Metro stop, which has become a decampment of sorts. A rallying point for friends and activists coming from all over the country. A sign-making post for protesters. A soapbox for those who want to hold their own mini-demonstrations. And of course, the local Starbucks has become a magnet for Wi-Fi refugees before they head into the masses assembled near the Washington Mall. Brad Milkey, ABC News, Washington. Now let's get a check on traffic. From the RMEGold.com Traffic Center, here's Mike Daniels. Thanks, Allie. Still working that crash in Chandler, Loop 202 eastbound Arizona Avenue. We have a wreck off to the right right there on the off-ramp and a crash at 19th Avenue and Mountain View Road. This report brought to you by Denny's. Denny's $4 value meal now offers twice as many options as before, like the super blackberry pancakes, the biscuits and gravy breakfast, and more. It's probably the greatest $4 value menu in the world. I'm Mike Daniels, KTAR News. It's 56 degrees in Gilbert. Weather brought to you by Howard Air. Whether a place or repair, call Howard Air. I'm Allie Bettner on Arizona's news station, KTAR News. Arizona, an amazing state for outdoor recreation and exploration. Full of mountains, lakes, streams, forests, and of course, our beautiful deserts. Hunting, fishing, camping. If it's about the outdoors, we've got it covered. KTAR invites you to get outdoors with Mike Russell. Today at noon, KTAR News on 92.3 FM and on every device with the KTAR app. Here's what Carrie from Tempe had to say about her experience with Good Works Auto Repair. As soon as you realize, I need to get some work done on my car, I'm sure the thought occurs to you that you're about to get taken for a ride. I used to share the same sentiment and wondered if the shop was going to make something up and have me spending hundreds of dollars instead of 30 I was planning on for a simple oil change. This is one of the reasons I will only go to Good Works Auto Repair. Because I trust them. Putting trust in an auto shop didn't come easily. It's been built over several visits with them doing exactly what was needed. Not coercing me into unnecessary work. Ask them for an oil change and a safety inspection. They do just that. No baloney, list of filters, belts, and whatchamacallits that need replacing on my new car. Thank you, GoodWorks Auto Repair, for being there for me when I need you. Appreciate the kind words. It's always a pleasure. Glenn Hayward here. Come experience what award-winning auto service should be. GoodWorks Auto Repair in Tempe or visit us at GoodWorksAutoRepair.com. Are you looking for a refreshing change in customer service? I'm Lee Weatherby from Accurate Automotive. How about a refreshing change in your car repair relationship with honest, clear, and responsive service that looks out for your needs and not ours? For over 20 years, we've been delivering award-winning service provided by ASC certified technicians with one goal, looking out for your best interest. If it needs fixing, we'll tell you. If it doesn't, you'll know that too. I guarantee that you will not get that business-as-usual treatment at Accurate Automotive. Foreign and domestic, cars, trucks, and even fleet service, Accurate can handle your job. I invite you to come in and experience a refreshing difference in car repair 
and maintenance. Stop by for a free courtesy inspection. A $49 value. We feel it is well worth our investment in you because we know that good long-term relationships start early. With your first walk through our doors, I'm Lee Weatherby, and I'll be there to greet you. Accurate Automotive, home of friends serving friends, just off Broadway and Robeson in Mesa since 1992. For more information, check us out at accurateautomotiveaz.com today. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen. Together we are your KTAR car guys. And we are taking phone calls, helping you with your car, and text at 411-923-602-277-5827. Matt, looks like i got a text here. Is the heater core connected to the defroster? But I thought it was my understanding you could defrost hot or cold. It just depends on what you wanted to go with. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, the answer to the question is yes. Yes. I mean, they they work in with each other. I mean, the, the defroster wants heat. But I, I guess the defroster would work as long as your air conditioner is working because we're, I mean, we're using the air conditioner to pull the condensation out, out of the air. So you're oftentimes in the middle of the winter, your air conditioner is, st- is still running. Uh, but I, I, you know, you're not going to get a windshield iced, you know, that's iced or anything off of, uh, you know, yeah, w- no. without the heat. So. I literally had an 01 Dodge truck and the heater core was bad and it was bad for years when I drove it. It always left a haze on the bottom of that windshield and I could smell it and I just kind of. Yeah, I'm used to the smell of coolant. I mean, I taste the stuff. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Just taste it. Just everything's good in moderation, right, Dave? So anyhow, well, let's get to, looks like we're going to go with, man, there's so many choices here. Meeny, we're, meeny, miny. We're going to go with Stephen and Gilbert. He's got a 2012 Honda Civic HS. How can we help you, Stephen? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thanks so much for taking my call. You I bet. appreciate it. Um, I have had this car for... Just coming up on two years now, and it's wonderful. The gas mileage is excellent, and I have no complaints. But the, um, a couple months ago, uh, the cool, let's see, what is it called, low temperature indicator came on, and um, it comes on and off every once in a while. And I, I don't know, like, should I, does that mean anything? Does it just mean a bad sensor? Is, is it worth fixing, or can I just let it be? Because well, it seems to be fine. Well, you have a 2012 car, so of course it's worth fixing. I mean, just think of all the things you said, how fantastic it runs and the mileage and great car. So you don't ever want to get into that thought of, uh, you know, is it worth fixing? But uh, what, what exactly did the light say? Low temperature? Yeah, it says it's a low temperature indicator. It says it comes on for a few seconds when you turn the uh, ignition switch to on, uh-huh. and then it it says it comes on when the engine coolant temperature is low. Okay. But this, it came on in the middle of the summer, so I'm like, I don't know how this can be true. <laughs> well, well, and it can be, and that's kind of, I don't know if you were mentioning in the first part, or if you heard in the first part of the show, I talked about, uh, you know, when when the weather's colder out, you know, that we could see start seeing some check engine lights. And we do get them in the winter. But what's happening there, like I said before, is the, the car manufacturers and the federal government to get the emissions down. We need to get these cars heated up as fast as we can. So they started monitoring this temperature increase in the warm-up cycle in the computers, you know, several years ago. So... What happens is the thermostat sticks open and allows water to flow. Therefore, the water is not sitting in the engine where it would otherwise heat up because a normal a, a thermostat working properly is closed. It reaches the temperature, whatever that is, 195, 200 degrees, whatever whatever the number is, and opens and allows water to flow. And as the fresh water, as the hot water leaves and the cool water comes in, that thermostat's going to close up again. Well, in your case, the thermostat's just open. So the water's always flowing so that it's taking forever to get the engine heated up. You probably will notice that your heater doesn't work very well either. Pro- now, if you do have a good heater, but the computer is still showing low temperature, well, we've had bad sensors and bad connections too. Oftentimes, it's the thermostat, and you get the two-for-one light off and a heater once you fix it. And anything with the cooling or heating in the car, the first thing to wreck a car in the summer here is when someone overheats a car. So anything temperature-related, you got to have good dials to know if you got something going on. So we don't want to skip any of that stuff that's going to warn you that we got a problem. So I would say it is definitely wor- worth looking into because you got to have gauges that you can trust. I mean, that's for sure. So yeah. You know, Stephen, if you're looking for a shop, 
if you have a great maintenance relationship and you're taking that car somewhere and they're taking good care of it for you, great, stick with them. But if you're looking, go to bumper to bumper com. You'll find good shops all over the valley. I see you're in Gilbert, but maybe need one where, where, you know, someone where near where you work. There's a number of different guys on there that can help you. We've got Ron. We've got another Ron. We've got Kimberly, but we're going to go with Ron in El Mirage. He's got a 2005 Nissan Frontier. Looks like he's got a 4-liter. How can we help you, Juan? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Uh, uh, I've been taking my uh, truck to the dealer, and they told me the, the uh, timing chain guides are running or are going out. Uh-huh. Is that a big job, or how long do I have until, I don't know, something happens? How many, how many miles are on that one? Uh, 188. Okay, and it, does it get a little bit of rattle noise in it when you're starting it in the morning or maybe just running it? Yeah, it sounds like uh, it's becoming to be a diesel now. Yeah, so yeah, I, it, it it's expensive. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like at least a five hour job. Oh, every, every bit of it. I mean, but you know now, now there's a couple ways that you can do this. You know, uh, over the years, Dave and I talk about how subjective car repair is, right? How one guy can fix it. Dave used the example of putting a window in your house. You just want the lowest price, right? That's what everybody thinks is the best deal, is the lowest price. And Juan, I got to tell you, some people might go in and just replace the tensioners and to quiet the thing up. It makes for an inexpensive job, but you've got 180,000 miles on it. The timing chain's like a bicycle chain, except a lot more important mm-hmm. and a lot harder to get to. <laughs> <laughs> there's tensioners, there's idlers, there's uh, guides, there's gears. There's gears. You want to replace it all, and um, I would suggest that you can probably find a competitive price at one of the bumper to bumper shops, and maybe it's time to get that out of the dealership life For cycle sure. and, uh, and go that way. But but you don't have much time either. Do it before you ruin it or move on well we're going to go with ron in sun city he's got a 2014 toyota camry how can we help you ron you're on bumper to bumper radio well good morning thanks for taking my call fellas. i have a 2014 camry that i bought new in january of 2014 love the car it's great but in april of 2015 i went out to start it up and it was dead so i got the car started and i called the dealer he said bring it in the, the, the result was they said it was a dead battery. So they put a new battery in. I went for another year with the car, and in April of 2016, another dead battery. So I took it into a different dealer. Again, they did their diagnostic tests, and they said nothing was wrong. So now I'm jumping the car with a battery tender almost every night. They told me that's what I needed to do, and uh, it just seems wrong that I've had three batteries on a car that's only three years old. And so I'm wondering if there's something besides diagnostic testing that needs to be done to solve the problem as to why my battery is going dead all the time. Dave's well, got something for you. It wouldn't be t- completely out of the ordinary that someone would get a battery three years in a row, although it's a lot. It's a lot of batteries. But sometimes I think he's saying he's got to keep a battery tender on it. Sometimes uh, these cars will have what we call a key-off draw, and that could be a light bulb in the trunk that's on because the light switch in the trunk is not hitting all the way. And so you can have something that's draining down the power of the battery uh, over the course of a night or two, and that could be part of it. That's something that comes to mind. We could have an alternator that's underperforming. That's yeah, something that he, comes to mind. I'd like, I would be highly suspicious that he ha- actually has a, quote, battery problem. The battery is the symptom here for sure. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess one thing I would start with, the dealers in many cases add on these aftermarket stuff, alarms and stuff mm-hmm. that is supposed to be there on the lot to protect it while it's on the lot, and then they try and sell it to you afterwards. I, I guess maybe if I were tackling this, I would start by eliminating any f- non-factory equipment that the car has, anything they bolted on, any aftermarket alarms or anything like that. I'd get rid of that first. But this thing is still under warranty. I know. You know, this starts to stink lemon law, too. Yeah, the other thing, too, is that, that the way that uh, when people say, oh, I just ought to be fine. Oh, all Toyotas do that. Or they, no. they use these big, broad statements. you got a car that's built in this decade. There should be none of this battery tender stuff going on. You should hit the key every time, and it should go boom. And that's just the way it should be. But when people say that because they don't want to fix some hard-to-find problem, well, yeah, because it's on their dime when it's under warranty. You know, Leave it down there and tell them you'll come pick it up when it's fixed. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and again, you may, maybe it's time to go to a different dealer. Cause remember, you don't, you're not bound to the dealer just cause that's where you bought the car. The manufacturer is who warranties that for you. Yeah, so, for sure. So maybe, and if you can't get any satisfaction, maybe you ramp it up and ask for the regional manager. For sure. Well, let's go with Kimberly in Scottsdale. Looks like maybe she's looking at getting a Mini Cooper of some sort. How can we help you, Kimberly? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Fantastic. Enjoying the rain or the rain last night. Awesome. Well, we came from a uh, negative six degree temperature, so this is like um, a heat wave for us. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I just had a quick question. We were at, and it's kind of not a bumper to bumper question, but you guys may be familiar since you are the specialist. Um, We were just at Barrett Jackson. Um, all week, and we saw a couple Mini Coopers there, the Countrymen. Have you heard any reviews on them or uh, any operational or anything we should be looking at if we go to purchase one of those? Are you looking at something that's used, or you were, were you looking at a mini display of new cars? Um, well, the Countryman uh, is one of the new ones coming out. But I don't know. Have you heard any reviews on the Mini Coopers at all? Well, okay, yeah. But what I was, yes, I have. What you need to do is be careful. You can you can Google and find all kinds of stuff. The Mini Coopers consume a lot of oil. That's that's one of the problems with them. Uh, there's a lot of cars nowadays that are burning. What Consumer Reports says is excessive amounts of oil, and I, I tend to agree with them. But Cooper is one of those. So you want to look at that. I mean, if you're buying a new car. You can find anything to complain about the new car. I mean, you go to these blogs. You want to find something to complain about the nicest car in town? There will be a blog finding something wrong with, wrong with, wrong with it. But if if you're going to go buy a new one, get a car that you like, and if you think you're going to enjoy it, go test drive it uh, the best you can. Make sure it's functional for you, and then do the maintenance. I'm a little bit slow to mention this, but you know, because I did drive a Honda Element, I got some grief from my 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 men friends. And, uh, you know, I, I like Mini Coopers. I think they're fun to drive. Oh, yeah. Oh, they got some of them got the paddle shifters and turbos and all that stuff. I would say for a cool car, get a Mini Cooper. But they are a little bit more maintenance heavy. And I would just yeah. say that's just kind of an overall feel that I get from a lot of shops that are working on Minis all the time. But they're a cool car. If you want a cool car, they get are. a Mini. Yeah. And cut the maintenance from the manufacturer in half. They're not doing 10,000 mile oil changes. They'll be out of oil four times over by that. For sure. Well, thanks <laughs> so. for the call, Kimberly. When we come back, we're taking calls at 602-277-5827. You listen to Matt and Dave, your KTR Car Guys on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, Lisa Henry with Russ Lyons, Sotheby's International Realty. Have you been thinking maybe the time is right to move, but you're not sure if you have enough equity in your home or if it really is a good time? Well, home values have increased significantly over the past few years, and interest rates are still historically low. For how long? No one knows. But for every 1% increase in the interest rate, the result is about a 10% loss in purchasing power. So it might be a really great time to sell your home and either upsize or downsize to a new home while the interest rates are still low. Contact me via my website at lisareneehenry.com or direct at 480-330-9530 for a no-obligation market valuation on your home and to hear about our global online marketing plan designed to sell your home quickly for top dollar. Again, that's lisareneehenry.com, 480-330-9530. Come experience the difference a truly customer-focused real estate agent can make. Quiet, please. The Waste Management Phoenix Open is back, and you can go as a VIP this year, courtesy of our friends at Visit Central Oregon. Go to BunkerGolf.com and click on the VIP Experience banner and enter to win. Winner receives tickets, members club passes for four, and reserve parking at the Greenish Show on Grass. Stop by the Visit Central Oregon booth in the Expo Tent for another chance to win a golf vacation to Bend Sun River, Oregon, with over 30 courses including three in Golf Digest Top 100. Central Oregon. Adventure Calls. Hi, I'm Kurt Morgan, owner of Shadow Mountain Auto Service in Phoenix. I'm also a college automotive instructor, and I've been a technician for over 30 years. In that time, I've seen all kinds of games and gimmicks in the auto repair business, the worst of which seems to be associated with transmissions. I think it's because, to most, including technicians, the inside of a transmission is a mystery. So when one of our valued customers has a transmission problem, we send them straight to Tri-City Transmission. No games, no gimmicks. That's Tri-City Transmission. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, KTAR News on 92.3 FM.
Well, Matt, we've got uh, four phone calls and a few minutes to get after it. I think we're going to take Ron with the transmission question. This happens to be my favorite topic is transmissions. I mean, I, I like Ron, to talk about all of it. Ron with Yukon. Today was Ron with Ron, Ron, and Juan. What's up, Ron, okay. with the transmission? <laughs> Hi, thanks, guys. Uh, I got a 99 Yukon, 225,000 miles. I just put in a new transmission. I'm getting a vibration under my left foot. It, I think it's a vibration, and it makes noise, and I can feel it every time it shifts. It doesn't vibrate when I'm driving along, just before it shifts. What do you mean a new transmission? It, it's a come right out of the box. Okay, well, I, I had the Chevrolet ever, dealer put it. Okay. Pardon me? So you bought a remanufactured one from the dealer. It came in the black crate. Yes, it was a brand. They said it was brand new. Well, it was a rebuilt, but okay. So okay. That, and then how? And then who installed that for you? Did you do it? it Chevrolet dealer. Oh, the, oh, the dealer did the whole deal. Okay. Dave, right. What do you, think? you know, I mean, as far as uh, is it on every shift? So you're going to shift from first to second, second to third, third to fourth. Do you feel it each shift consecutively? Each, each time, each time I'll feel that, but just before it shifts, it starts vibrating under my foot. And as soon as it shifts, it goes away. Then comes the next shift, it vibrates and goes away. When you put the thing into drive in the morning, you take it out of park and you go into drive, or you take it out of park and you go into reverse, does that feel normal to you? Yes. Okay. I mean, generally, that's not a description or a problem we really run into in transmissions. Now, if you've got a transmission that is running a low line pressure, sometimes you'll get chattering in the shifts. Is it consistent? Okay. Is it consistent? Each and every shift feels the same? Yes, it is. Mm. It just doesn't. It Every doesn't, time, it doesn't really feel so much like a transmission problem. I mean, it, although I want to kind of relate the two, but uh, you know, there's all kinds of things. So there's engine mounts and transmission mount and stuff like that. But, so, and like, I just had brand new engine mounts put in, and mm -hmm. uh, the ball joints are replaced. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. New or not doesn't mean they're all bolted down. I mean, that's what I'm yes. that's that's what I'm saying. So a bunch of people were just in there. So yeah. I would get it back to them and just say, hey, this is, you know, take somebody for a drive with you so you can show them what's going on. But 225,000 miles, I think that's like 12 times around the world, something like that. It's got a few miles on it. Dave, so, do you, you want to say anything about people's perception of new transmissions? I mean, yeah, because they are misrepresented and there's no real definitions you know, by the Federal Trade Commission or by the state of Arizona or anything. But it's new to the vehicle, and just because it's in a box doesn't mean it's new. It just means that it was done by some factory, you know, maybe in Texas. A lot of them are done. But uh, it's, it's, it's rebuilt or remanufactured, and those aren't standards. And so sometimes I think it's misrepresented. Well, I got a new transmission. Well, some of those new transmissions aren't as good as rebuilt transmissions. Well, yeah, they're not new, and... and they paint them nice. And if they were new, you probably couldn't afford one. And that's got nothing to do with how much money you got. The darn thing would be so expensive. They're just right? designed they're, to be redone. There's, so they're, There's no such thing as a new one. But the other thing with those transmissions, you, you know, the perception is that GM factory, we're mm -hmm. rebuilding these transmissions. No, GM put out a bid, and Tri-City Transmission could be doing those if they would have put it in a bid to say, I'm going to guarantee the lowest price because you're going to buy 5,000. GM's going to buy 5,000 of these this year. That's just going out to the lowest bidder. They've got to fix those things as cheap as possible. Some may get some new parts that the other ones may not get. Uh, so you're it's, one of, it's one of those bid processes, too, where you got it's like a three-year contract, and the price has to get better for three consecutive years. So year one, they may be pretty good, but by year three, you know how people put their best foot forward, like right off the bat, you know, and then on the third date, you're like, really? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's really what you do? So, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, Ron, you'd be wound up much better at a place like Tri-City where they're going to remanufacture your transmission and put all the right stuff in there. And and it and you know who did it and it's it's and it's the one that came in the car too which I think there's something to be said about that. Well, yeah, because you may get a transmission's been in four different cars before yours. So I mean, how many times you want to redo these things? It's like when you reload ammo. You know, how many times you want to redo a shell? It gets harder and longer every time you shoot it. So that's something to be considered. But anyhow, I think if you go back to the dealer and get it, get a service rider in the car with you, go for a ride. You can show them; they'd be more than happy to double check it for you. So anyhow, thanks for the call. We're going to go with Mike in Surprise. He's got a 95 Nissan Pathfinder. How can we help you, Mike? You're on bumper to bumper. Well, radio. I got a I got a transmission issue with my with my Pathfinder as well. It's a uh, it's a 95 SE V6 uh, 4x4, and the the issue is is prior to the 
transmission being rebuilt, there was a little bit of a uh, issue with uh, with slipping before. Well, not necessarily slipping, just having a hard time shifting in the first. And then after the transmission was rebuilt, it was still it still had the same problem. Now I got about ten thousand miles past that rebuild, and I don't want to go into first. When you now, say first, so when you when you put your car into drive from park, you go to drive. You're in first gear right then at that time. So the first well, it, the first shift you feel is into second gear. Is it that yeah, first it, shift you feel? Yeah, the first shift you you feel is into second gear. Um, and well, that's what's been told to me by by a mechanic that I know, and he said that it's starting off in second rather than in first, and because um, it like bogs down real bad whenever you first start whenever you first start driving. And then it'll eventually it'll eventually catch up to speed, and, and then it shifts gears properly through second, third, and fourth. Um, but what I'm wondering is, I was I was looking at some forums online, and and I saw that maybe there might be a problem with the vacuum lines. I mean, would it be worth it for me to try going through all of the vacuum lines before I take it to another transmission shop? You know, that's the trouble with a lot of the information on, on, on the on the Internet is that uh, you're not going to see a vacuum line on any transmission that sat late. So that's a, that's a RE4R01A is a transmission model that's in there. It's actually much like a Chevrolet 4, 4L60. They have the same drivetrain and they work the same way. So, but you very well may be starting out in second gear, so the first shift you feel is actually second to third and then third to fourth. One way to test that is take your shifter and just shift it down into one because the L is first gear. So you can find out real quick, and if all of a sudden it starts to take off faster when you go into low, well, that's what's going on. It's electrically controlled, and just because you had it rebuilt doesn't mean they changed those solenoids in there. You kind of had that problem beforehand, and we still have it, so I'm thinking... Maybe something didn't get fixed when it was redone, or there, there's uh, something else going on. So, But, yeah, no, it needs to be checked out by someone who's got transmission skills and can look at the command. There's transmission problems, and then there's transmission control problems, but there's no vacuum that controls that transmission. All right. So, anyhow, we've well, got... I'll sneak in uh, Monty with the Volkswagen Sport Wagon. Monty, go. what's going on with the VW? Well, here's, here's my quandary. I've got a 2012 uh, Jetta Sports Wagon TDI, so it's the diesel with the recall issues. Uh-huh. And here's what I'm wondering. It's got 95,000 miles on it. We love the car. So I've been to our local dealership and talked to him quite a bit, and he said that they're already doing the Gen 3 TDIs, which didn't affect the fuel mileage much, much or the torque. So mine's a Gen 2, which will be done later on in the year. So I guess, um, and I'm trying to find out online or see if there's anything they're going to do to this car to make it. Then the reason why we bought it, one was the torque, the fuel mileage, and the resale value, and the longevity of the motor. So have you heard anything they're going to do to these TDI, the Gen 2s, as far as performance goes, or is it just something I have to wait for? Well, is it... I, I haven't personally heard anything that that they're doing, you know, to the ones that are not part of the buyout. Um, now I don't know if it's lacking performance or you're just trying to make it get better performance. If they weren't that part of the recall, I seriously doubt anything's going to be happening with them. Well, and if they said something, I don't know if I'd believe them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I did notice that you can get 50 to 80 miles once the the fuel light turns on on the Jetta. So anyhow. Thanks for listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thanks, Bree, for running the dials. We'll see you next week.